Hi everyone, Hospice Nurse Julie here. Today I'm going to, to do a video, maybe like 10 minutes or so, I actually haven't timed it out, where I read comments from one specific video um, where I talk about people seeing dead relatives, dead loved ones, angels, dead pets. It's called visioning. It happens in so many people on hospice or towards the end of life. Um, just to be clear, I am not at all trying to say, oh, because of this, there is an afterlife, or because of this, you should believe there this or that. The whole point is we don't know why it happens and we don't. There were several comments about people saying, neuroscientists know why it happens and, and uh, it's because of DMT, it's because of this, it's because of that. Those are all theories and believe me, if a neuroscientist knew why this happened, I would know about it and I'd be telling you. I have no, I have no, um, I have no stake in this game. I just want you guys to know that it happens and it's normal. So when I posted that latest video about visioning on my shorts, if you want to go watch it, um, I got several comments of people who also experienced this with their loved ones. So I thought I'd read it because they're amazing. And then the second part of the video, I will be um, answering some common questions that I get from all of my videos. Okay, so let's do this. So the first one is this, and bear with me why I oral read. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not the greatest reader. Uh, I think it's because I'm dyslexic, but I've never actually been diagnosed. So a uh, follower writes, my mom told me she would see angels all the time. She said one would sit, uh, sit with her at night. A little girl sat with her and gave her comfort. This was while she was at home. She wasn't on any medication or anything to cause hallucinations. I have so many stories like this. Thank you for writing in. Uh, my mom experienced visioning. She spoke in Spanish to her mother, sister, cousins, angels, and then would stop the conversation, speak in English to her children who were actually at her bedside. Uh, and it was a privilege and lovely to experience this. Um, she did eventually die she said at age 94. let's see days before my mom died she saw baby angels interesting a day before she died she saw her father and mother and she told them to come back later and then someone wrote my husband did that he was looking next to him and laughing and laughing he was very happy he passed a few days later yeah so visioning always brings comfort um, as healthcare professionals, we work, we are around people who are dying all the time. So we know the difference between delusions, hallucinations, paranoia, delirium, um, ICU psychosis versus visioning. Visioning will always bring comfort. Um, so if it's not bringing comfort, it's likely something else. Oh, I love this one. It says, Right before my mom died in the hospital, she looked at me startled when I walked into the room. My brother and I hadn't spoken in eight years. Uh, she said, oh, did you make up with Marty yet? Where's my mother? Where did she go? She was turning around looking for her mom. And yes, Marty and I did make up. Um, oh, here's a good one too. Yes, my husband said he saw an angel was sitting at the edge of the bed and I wish I would have asked about a description. I was so curious, but I was amazed that he even said it. He wasn't a man to make things up or to lie. So I knew he was experiencing something wonderful. Also, he was lucid. That's another thing about visioning. People are usually not confused. They're very usually very lucid. So a lot of times people will say, oh, it's because they have low oxygen. No, <laughs> I know what someone looks like when they have low oxygen. This is usually a month before someone dies. So they're usually not even like actively dying. They're usually very lucid and just telling you what they see. Um, let's see here. Oh, I love hearing from other hospice professionals. So this one writes, I have worked with hospice patients for approximately three years and I've seen this phenomenon many times as well. Yes, any hospice professional will tell you this. Dead family members, dead friends, etc., always there to stop by. One woman told me that her friends were preparing a party in her honor when she arrived. A lot of times I noticed that visioning seems to calm the patient and make them feel relaxed. Right, exactly. I have the same experience. 
Um, my beloved mother-in-law said she could hear beautiful music. Shortly after, she seemed to sleep and the death rattle came a few minutes later. I have experienced so much of what you described. Uh, this one's a good one too. Yes, my BFF had cancer. She would always see angels. When she got closer to her body giving out, she said, my dad's here and I think I'm going with him. <laughs> I love that one. Oh, this one's really good too. Uh, mum, M-U-M. So they're from, they're not from the U.S., which I love. Looks like they're from London, maybe. Oh no, Australia, my bad. So they're from Australia. Hello. She says, or he, not sure. Um, mom and me were talking. Mom was sitting in the chair and all of a sudden she looked up at the door and said, Jim, what are you doing here? I looked as if I was really going to see my dad. <laughs> uh, straight after this, my mom just carried on with our conversation as if it never happened. Um, another time she pointed to the corner of the room and said, there's a man, my husband, he, my husband and me looked up as if we could see the man. I don't believe my mom knew who he was. Thank you for your channel. Love from Australia. Yeah, sometimes they don't know who the people are that are visiting, but usually they are not disturbing them. They, they like it. So it sounds like her dad had already died and then she saw her dad, uh, her husband there. I love it. A few more. One day before my mother passed, I could hear her talking to someone as I entered the room. I could see no one in the room. As I approached her bedside, she smiled brightly and said to whoever she was talking to, oh, this is my baby girl, and introducing me to definitely someone special, but I couldn't see them. Interesting. And then this is a really good one too. I was a little girl and my great grandma was passing. Um, I, I was very little, so I don't remember much of what happened, but I vividly remember her he hearing her exclaim from the bedroom, oh, what a beautiful light. I'll never forget that moment. That's amazing. Um, my mother saw and carried on conversations with her siblings and her husband. We listened all the time, and one time she, one time she said, I know you can't see them, but they're there. And then she says her dog Smokey was ever present past 20 years prior and she would tell us to make sure he's fed. Oh my gosh, so good. Make sure you guys put in the comments if you've experienced something like this too. Okay, so it's seven minutes um, so far and now I'm getting to the question point. So I'll probably talk for another... I don't know, we'll see, maybe 15, maybe another like five to 10 minutes making this a total of like 15 or 20 minute video. I always like to give everyone a heads up just in case because I would wanna know how long a video is going to be. This is me just answering questions because I feel like it's really important. So what does it mean when someone is actively dying? What does that look like? So I have several videos about this, but just so you know, actively dying is the very, very end of life phase. If you're on hospice and dying a natural death, we call it actively dying. It's a few hours to a few days before someone dies, usually. They are usually fully unconscious, not eating and drinking. You will see changes in their breathing patterns. They'll be breathing differently. Their eyes and mouths may be open, like gaping open. Um, they may have terminal secretions, which is the death rattle, which, we've, which I've talked about. Um, changes in skin color, which is modeling. And then uh, sometimes you have end of life fevers as well. So the temperature may fluctuate. So those are the things you're going to be seeing. They're usually not conscious. They're usually not talking to you or doing anything. They're kind of looks like they're just in a very, very deep sleep or almost like a coma. And your body does that naturally. That's not because of medication. So there you go with that one. So someone wrote to me, I think sarcastically, but that's okay, because I like to answer questions like this. So she says, you think starving in no fluids is peaceful, question mark? So I get this all the time. So our body needs fluid and hydration and food and nutrients to survive, right? We all know this. This is why people have such a hard time grasping this. The only time the body doesn't need that is when it's dying. And then those things will not even do what they're supposed to be doing. So if someone's in the end of life phase, they are 
in the end of life, we know it, they're dying within a few days, we can tell because we're healthcare professionals and we do this all the time and they've already been on a hospice for a while. Once they're in this uh, end of life phase, it could be even a few months, the more we let their body tell us what it needs, which is usually they're not hungry or thirsty, the better they usually feel and the more peaceful they die. Now, if they are asking for food and water, by all means, give it to them, especially if they can still swallow. Um, but they usually aren't. And especially during the actively dying phase, when they're really not taking anything in, it can be up to two weeks. And um, we, and this is, this is fact. I'm not, I'm not just like saying this. As a healthcare professional, anyone in the healthcare world, this is science, we, we know this. Let's just say someone says, we don't believe you, we're gonna put an IV into a dying person anyway and give them all the fluid that, we give them, give them tons of fluid to hydrate them. That will literally make them die quicker and less peaceful because the fluid that we're giving them is not gonna stay intravascular and hydrate and do good things for their body. It's going to third space and cause edema, swelling in the legs, and then eventually back up because the heart's not strong enough to pump all the fluid out, it'll back up into their lungs. And then they will have respiratory distress, uh, maybe even respiratory arrest, and basically drown on their own fluids, on the fluids that we're giving. So when I say you think starving and no fluids is peaceful, yes, my dear, I hope you're listening, you're probably not, but yes, it is, it's a medical fact. Um, so the more you know, and I hope you see that, the more you know. It's not like when someone's lost out at the desert and they have this healthy body that's fully functioning and then they starve and thirst to death. It's not like that. This person has been in the dying process and the end of life for a very long time. Their body is not working like a normal person whose perfectly healthy body is working. That's the difference. They don't have that severe thirst like you would think they have. They don't have that severe hunger pain like you think they would have. In general, I guess there's always exceptions to the rule, right? Always, but in general, I'd say 98%, maybe even 99% of people, uh, this is true for. So the more you know, folks. So someone also said, um, like I said before, when I posted that video about um, people visioning, which is a thing that happens at the end of life and we don't know why, someone wrote, LOL, neuroscientists know why. And I'm not gonna have all sarcastic comments, I promise, but I just think this is funny. So no, neuroscientists don't know why. <laughs> they don't, if they did, I would tell you. That's the whole mystery. If we freaking knew why this stuff happened, I'd be the first to tell you, I wanna know why. I'm not, I'm not even trying to act like, I'd, like I'm, I, I have no agenda to make you believe something, right? My only agenda is to teach you what we all see and uh, you make your own assumptions. But no, neuroscientists don't know why. There are theories, of course, but we don't know why. So, there you go. What would you say to someone who is scared to die? I would say that's very normal. And the more you talk about it, the better it is, I have found. And if you are even willing to mouth those words, if you truly are terminal, Right. I mean, I think a lot of people fear death in general, right? But if you are actually terminal and you know you're gonna die and you are able to verbalize, I'm afraid to die or I don't want to die or I don't wanna leave my kids, right? Those are really hard sentences. I don't even have children and that was just hard for me to say. So when that is actually a reality, that's super scary. And the fact that someone may actually be willing to even say that, they're ahead of the game. Because as, you, as most of us know, and I didn't create this quote, someone else did, but what we resist persists, right? The more we resist the reality of things, the worse things usually get. So if you are able to say, I'm afraid, I will usually just meet people where, they at and, and where they're at and say, I understand. Mm -hmm. It's really normal to feel afraid and we don't need to make things better for people. People just need to be heard and need to be validated. So usually I'll start with that and then I'll say, and just so you know, we deal with this 
We meaning the hospice team, not just me, hospice doctor, social worker, chaplain, CHHA, home health aide, volunteers. We, do, we deal with this day in and day out. And we are here to support you and help you. And you, just so you know, we deal with this all the time. So we aren't afraid. We can help you. Um, just to know that it's normal to feel afraid and here's how we can support you. And just keep talking to us. And you're gonna have good days and you're gonna have bad days. And you're gonna have days where it's like paralyzing and you're gonna have days where you feel free and good. And, and that's it. You know? Um, let's see. So what's the death with dignity law? So it's the death with dignity law or medical aid in dying. It is available in the United States. A lot of people don't think it is. This is when you are diagnosed with something terminal, less than six months to live. You get two doctors to sign off that you're like alert and oriented and can make your own choices and lucid and can take the medication yourself and you can get medication to end your own life. That is legal in the United States. Now it's not a federal law, so can't, not every state is it legal. It's only legal in 11 states. Montana is the 11th state, but you have to go through the court system, I think, so it might take a little longer. The other states, um, I'm not gonna be able to name all of them, but I'll try. And I have other videos about it you can go through and look. Um, California, I know that because I work here and do it. Um, California, Oregon, Washington, I think DC, uh, which I know is not a state, but DC does have it. New Mexico, Colorado, Vermont, New Jersey. These two I always forget. I don't know, but th that's eight at least. You can do it in. Um, when I talk about the different phenomena and people seeing things and it's comforting them, people always ask me, well, does anyone ever see demons? Um, I've never witnessed that. So in general, I feel like people with certain diagnoses, Parkinson's disease, dementia, sometimes brain tumors, they can be agitated. So they can start seeing things that are not good. And, and a lot of that I think is paranoia and the disease process, not necessarily them visioning like they're demons and they're going to hell. I don't actually believe in that, but that's my own personal belief. And no, I haven't really witnessed it. Um, when you're a non-Christian, what do you see? So yes, uh, religion doesn't seem to play a part in the visioning. Christians do sometimes see Jesus, but people who are not Christian um, still have beautiful visions of angels and things. So uh, religion doesn't seem to uh, play a part in that. And people who are atheists don't like see demons and stuff. So people who are atheists and don't even believe in this stuff still see things sometimes. So uh, religion doesn't seem to play a part. <laughs> Let's see what else. Can people on hospice be full code? Full code means CPR if your heart stops, um, a breathing tube and breathing machines. Um, so people on hospice can be full code. We can do that. It doesn't really make much sense. So we try to continue to educate the family and see where their fear is and see what they're not understanding. And hopefully they will switch off of being full code. To me, being full code is for someone who is completely healthy and young. Uh, if you're not completely healthy and young, you should not be full code. No one should be doing CPR on like a 90 year old woman, even if she's in perfect health, because it cracks your chest, breaks your ribs. It usually doesn't help. And you just die anyway, and you just suffered a whole heck of a lot. So I would never want full code um, unless you're young and healthy. If you're young and not healthy, I would not, I, I would not do full code. But technically you can be full code on, on hospice because we don't wanna we don't wanna deny people care just because of that reason. Um, when the breathing slows down and at the end they kind of gasp those last few breaths, is that person fighting? Are they feeling what you know, are they feeling like they're out of air or no? Great question. So at the end of life, there are breathing patterns that happen that are very normal. One of them is called chain stokes breathing. It's like very short, shallow and rapid. And then they hold their breath. 
for a long time, a long time, longer than you think someone should hold their breath. And then they'll do it again. Sometimes you see agonal breathing. It looks really bad, but it's not. It's normal, it's actually a reflex. Sometimes you see fish out of water breathing. Like they're like it looks like they're trying to breathe. Keep in mind, people who are doing those breaths are unconscious. If they're not unconscious, we do need to give them medication to help them be more comfortable because they, they but the, usually this is all the body just shutting down and the body doing different things to help it shut down. So um, the person's usually incredibly, or not incredibly, but the person is usually unconscious because they're you're, you're you can't really be conscious with the levels of oxygen that are in your body at that time and they're not very high because you're not breathing correctly everything is shutting down so your brain is not on your brain is not on circuit it's somewhere else so the body is just fully shutting down so they are not um, in any discomfort they don't feel like they can't breathe it's a natural part of death and dying how do i know that if they can't tell us that's always a question i uh, i get asked we know that because as healthcare professionals, we are trained to trained, taught, practice how to notice nonverbal pain. We also know because we do this day in and day out, and we see people doing this all the time. So we see people doing this when they are comfortable and how they look and what their body looks like, and we assess, and when they look uncomfortable and what they look like and how their body looks and what we assess. So we can tell, you get really good at knowing the difference between someone who is unconscious and comfortable and someone who is unconscious and not comfortable. That is how we know. So I hope that answers that. And that's the last question that I have for today. So 21 minutes. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Um, you can leave comments in this video and maybe I'll do another uh, video answering those questions in the comments, or I can read some of your stories in the comments if you have some of your own stories. I hope you liked it. Um, don't forget to like this video, leave a comment if you want, and subscribe if you're interested. Thanks guys. Hospice Nurse Julie, I'm out.